Oh, wow, look at this. Look at that, you guys are so nice. I tell you, one thing about folks I realized in Palm Springs, greater Palm Springs, they're very nice and they're very punctual. It's amazing, like no one in Denver was ever on time. This, you guys are great. Um, my name is Adam Lerner and I'm the Joanne McGrath direct, Director and CEO of the Palm Springs Art Museum. I want to welcome you to a biased orientation to the field of contemporary art. This is part two, um, sociology. Um, I want to thank the Intersect Art and Design, as well as Artsy, for their generous support of tonight's program. Thank you very much. You can applaud them. They're supporting us with that. Um, I'm always so amazed uh, at, at who's in the audience, and, and last time uh, I got to s hear all the great questions and meet all the folks, and I was really, really impressed by, um, by, the, by the level of knowledge. Um, and I want to say to all those people here with such great knowledge of the field, um, what are you doing here? Why? Well, like, I really, really am impressed. Um, but I, I, I will show you things that are probably pretty familiar to you, um, to many of you, even people who are not extremely knowledgeable about the field. And what I hope to do is to offer you some sort of new perspective on it, a little bit of an original approach. Really, the purpose of this series is to be able to introducing my is to be able to introduce myself to you by way of introducing you to the art that makes up the all the points on the compass of my mind, the, the works that kind of stay with me, that 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 I become obsessed um, over, that orient me as I think about everything I do, not just art things. And um, uh, so welcome to the inside of my head. And uh, I, I hope you enjoy. <laughs> I hope you enjoy your stay. So, in the um, the late nineteenth century and uh, the first half of the twentieth century, the window was a crucial metaphor. Um, and that's true for very much for for all of the romantic poets, Charles Baudelaire, even Stéphane Mallarmé. Um, Mallarmé, they both had poems um, called uh, The Window or The Windows. Um, in Mallarmé's poem, he refers to um, windows as guilt by the chaste morn of the infinite. Guilt by the chaste morn of the infinite. And, um, that was very much the sort of the way that windows featured within this romantic poetry um, and, and sort of the thinkers of the time as some way of accessing the infinite. Uh, and, and, and art stood for this portal to the infinite. And uh, Pierre Bonnard was uh, a dear friend of Stéphane Mallarmé, and, um, and he had windows in many, many of his paintings. Um, this one here is called The Open Window from 1921, and you see that like, most of the canvas is taken up by the, by the open window, or, and, 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 or, or at least your eye is, is drawn to see through the window much more than you are your eye is drawn to to look at the interior scene and, and it maybe maybe even took you a while to notice that in the bottom right hand corner there's a figure sleeping there's a little cat there too oh no no um and and so bonar was one of the sort of closest adherents to the um the metaphor of the window um, but I, I feel like it represents a period. Um, and, and you could say that that, that concept lived uh, for deep into the 20th century, and you can see that in the work of Mark Rothko. You know, when, when he states, 
um, pictures must be miraculous, right? That, that, that what he looked for was some connection to the universal. He, like, he would famously say that he wasn't interested in people talking about relationship between colors. He wasn't interested in people looking at his painting in terms of its particular elements. He wanted to paint the way he did to be able to create some access to the universal. So I'm telling you about this um, by way, in order to be able to create a contrast. So if the window was the crucial metaphor for this period leading up through the first half of the 20th century, well, I believe that the corner was the central metaphor of the late 20th century. And that sounds crazy, I know, absolutely. Um, but I want to say that I believe it. If the window gives us a glimpse of the infinite, of the world beyond this one, well, the corner reminds us that we inherit a world made by others. Um, and we talked a little bit about this uh, last time, uh, about the notion of the corner. Um, well, Dan Flavin, the artist you see here, um, he made this work, this is his first corner piece, made in 1963. He put a fluorescent light in the corner, um, essentially stating that our capacity for poetry lies in our ability not to access the eternal light of nature, but rather to create our own light. And, and, and he um, made uh, works in, in the corner of the room like throughout his career. Here he even made a little teeny draw, a little drawing, which, which like, I'm not sure exactly why he made a drawing of the corner, but there's something uh, appealing nonetheless about it. Um, ways he is uh, opening up the corner, not to some sense of the infinite, but to some sense of maybe you could say the virtual, or like there is now a tension between not the real and the ideal space, but rather the, the reality and virtual reality. And maybe you could say that both of those 
form are two forms of reality, the physical and the optical. Um, and then he did another other works in the corner as well, this one with gravel. Um, in a way, um, suggesting that modern society creates its own opportunities for its own forms of the infinite, right? Has this throughout his career. Um, he, in 1968, he made a video of himself um, bouncing in the corner for an hour. I know, I know. It's amazing. It actually, um, I, I don't think I've watched it all the way through, but, um, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it, it's a sound like a sort of thump, 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 thump of his body bounces back um, into the corner. And I see that as an allegory for the fact that we moderns, we don't act into nature. We act into the world made by others, right? That's um, that we inherit a world and, and that is symbolized by like, the fact that we are, like we face uh, the built environment, our world, and then our action, maybe even the way we, the fact that we live, if you, if, you read the, if you really read that as a heartbeat, we live in a world that was created by others. Um, Richard Serra. Fasteners. Um, and, and, and I, and I, and I, and it's propped into the corner of a, of, of a room. And I read that as a reminder that every art object is on some level a collaboration with the world that contains it. Um, I mean, every painting you have in your home I mean, is a collaboration with the person who built your home, with the light the, your own with your lighting design in your house. I mean, you could you could see um, in how you recognize or not whether you recognize it or not um, that like that there is no such thing as an ideal space, which is what we imagine art to be hung on when we put it in the middle of a of a wall. It's just a, a kind of neutral zone, and by putting it into the in the corner, what these artists are doing is saying like, no, there is no ideal space. It's all real space that art exists within. It's always in some ways in relationship to the physical space around it. Um, and uh, I, I would say that even the physical experience um, of these objects suggests, like these, these, these Sarah, uh, like intense Sarah um, objects, um, when, when, you, when you're around them, I don't, I don't know how many of you have actually been around one of these pieces, but th th there's a sort of bodily sensation that you feel a little bit of terror around them, or being around such a massive, um, such, such a heavy thing that um, is, is not fastened to the wall, is simply um, nestled within the structure around it. It's just, it's, it's wedged there. Um, and I think that there's, the, I, I actually would say that um, that level of terror or fear that you have around that object just speaks to what is at stake or how much is at stake in believing that the art object is in some ways always in collaboration with, is always in some ways nestled within the society, the built world around it. Um, and so I call this lecture sociology, and I don't know, I had to give it some name, and so I called it that. And, and, but all of the artists that I'm talking about, they are interested in the structures of a society. Um, most of those structures, like, you know, in this case that I've, that I've talked about so far, are, are physical structures, um, but other ones are invisible structures. And, and from here on, I think more of the structures that I'll talk about are the sort of implicit rules that make up society. And so in the last lecture, what I talked about was how artists were interested in um, sort of those artists that I talked about were interested in sort of stripping away the trappings of society and looking at the human as human. And 
what I, all the artists I'm going to talk about here are interested in, like, what is the social being? How do how do how does people show up in art, or how does art make present something about us as a society? Like, what are the things that we might not see that are yet still the things that give meaning to us as society? And so that's why, I mean, I describe it as sociology, and in some sense, which implies like this is all a study of society. And some artists aren't necessarily studying it. The relationship is uh, varied, but yet it's always in some ways taking the initial fact uh, that we live in a society as the starting point for the art. And they do different things with it and have different relationships to that, that fact of what we are as a society. I believe that nobody intuited the implicit structure of modern society better than Andy Warhol. Um, and and like, sometimes I would even like think to myself, uh, like, oh yeah, like I, if I have a, a, a cool thought, I think, oh yeah, Andy Warhol thought that, you know? Like I, I, I really believe he understood um, the nature of modern society better than almost anybody. Um, so if I'm showing you, the one I'm showing you a Marilyn Monroe from 1967, but what he was, what he saw, you know, amongst many other things was the constant production of images in our society, as you all know. So um, what is interesting about the way he captures um, Marilyn here is that, as I see it, is that he captures her as both like um, the individual in her particularity as well as, as an example of that all-consuming system of production of images. So what you have is you have an image of Marilyn that is sort of not just an image of an individual, it's an image of the production of images. And you, and you get that in almost all of his works, but what I love about Warhol is that he understood how he himself was caught up in that system, the system of production, the system of the cycle of constant flow of imagery of our culture. And what I mean by he's caught up in it is that um, the, the, the circulation of images has an erotics to it. Um, the circulation of images has a, a, um, like a, a kind of constant state of uncertainty, a constant state of movement, a constant state of producing desire for the next and the next and the next. And, um, and the replacement of one to the other, that's the sort of dynamism of that. And that's what, he, what, what draws out in us our sense of um, our emotional response. And that's why we love celebrities, because their images are put before us constantly before, because there's sort of a constant shift in who, that, what, who is that image. Like that's the erotics of the system of image production. And what I wanna, the point I wanna make here about his interest in showing you both the production of the image of Marilyn as well as the image of the production of images um, can be best done through a contrast uh, with Lichtenstein. And I just wanna like, just, just I, I'm not, I'm not giving you an art history lecture here, but and I just want to, it's just helpful to show this comparison. So bear with me. Um, and if you look at the Lichtenstein image of the sort of female figure, um, you notice that, that um, the very thick lines that he uses, um, and those thick black lines create a little bit of a sense of distance, right? There's this feeling of um, irony that's very strong in a Lichtenstein, any, any Lichtenstein work. Whereas with Warhol, there's a sense of actual attachment, right? Because he doesn't use line, he uses color, which evokes emotion more directly. Um, there's a softness to her, her face 
that actually suggests that 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 he loved her, which he of course he, which he did, you know, and and he and he felt for her. That this, um, whereas what you see in Lichtenstein is a sense of ironic detachment, a sense of oh yes, this is what our society produces as its popular culture, right? But, and so therefore, he, it's as if he's pointing to it. He's, he's pointing to, po to, the, to the circulation of popular imagery. Whereas Warhol is it's as if he's breathing it in and breathing it out. Because he, he, feels, he feels all the feels of the popular circulation of imagery. Um, and what you, what you have with Warhol is a sense of identification and, and the feeling of desire. And, and with Lichtenstein, you actually, you know, you, that's where you have a sense of irony, which has its, in its nature a sort of what you might see as a simple dialectic, right? A thesis, antithesis, and then resolves itself. And, um, and, uh, and, and I think that I believe that what makes Lichtenstein great is actually his sort of composition, his use of color, and um, I think what makes Warhol great is this, this his in the intensity of his understanding how an image can actually encapsulate the entirety of imagery um, of our society. And so that's why um, this anomalous work by Warhol is so meaningful. Um, you know, he made this in 1962, the same year he produced his um, uh, the, the famous uh, uh, Campbell's Soup series, um, as well as other pop images imagery um, that are much more like signature works by Warhol. But I believe that this work, as an anomaly, says a great deal about like his interests because um, it suggests how much was at stake for him. It suggests that sort of ripping away the trappings of society to get access to what lies beneath, right? When you rip away the, the label to get access to the, the can, right? This thing that lies below. Um, that he's suggesting that actually um, that's, that's not what he's advocating, right? This is a kind of, this becomes a negative example. This becomes the thing that he fears because it's almost as if he's suggesting that like, that's the ugliness. Um, if we were to, if you rip away the label, then then what you don't you don't but you don't you don't get the seduction of the image, which is I think why you can read this as a as a self portrait. Um, it, because and, and and actually there's a very close analog to Warhol's self portraits where he himself is sort of um, hiding in the shadows and there's this sense of um, access to like how do you access what is beneath this the surface uh, of, 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 of Warhol and very much um, like the, 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 there's a sense of terror in war throughout Warhol with this idea of actually like connecting as as human he, he famously says that I don't want to say that uh, I don't want people to say that I died I want people to say that I disappeared, right? Um, because he, the fear of facing yourself as human, the fear of ripping away the label is something that is, is the terror. Um, so, so multiplicity is at the heart of Warhol's work because every picture of a consumer product or a celebrity implies the entire system and the constant cycle of images and products produces a kind of infinity of its own. Um, and this is what Hegel would call a bad infinity. By the way, I know it's it's a funny term for a philosopher, but um, it's a bad infinity because you know for Hegel the good infinities are the kind that you know Mahler may refer to. This is like the what what Mahler may refer to as the the chaste infinity. Right? This is not a chaste infinity. This is not virginal infinity. This is a human infinity. This is an infinity of n plus n equals n plus one, where you where every time an image is produced, it can easily be replaced by another image, just as every consumer product that is produced is easily replaced by another consumer product, another consumer product, another consumer product. So 
um, you have a kind of infinity that is a human infinity without a sort of non-transcendence, not actually ever, uh, you, might, you might want to call it like an indoor infinity, right? You never actually get to the eternity of, of nature. Um, and you get another view of that system um, in a range of other artists. And I think that there's, especially in the, in the um, later part of the 20th century, you really have artists attempting to find form for like the, that system that circulates products and images throughout our society. Like, so therefore, it's just as last time we talked about those artists who are trying to find form f and new imagery to describe the age-old issues of, that, that, we are, that we faced as humans that have had other forms throughout history. Um, you see like a kind of search for ways of um, finding new, new ways of describing like the very circulation of things in our in our in our society, almost like new new ways of creating snapshots. Um, so, uh, Burns and Hilda Becher, German photographers who started this series in the late 1950s, but continued uh, for many decades after. Um, you know what, what gives these works their charm is that these industrial architectural structures, they're all um, pretty similar to each other and just a little bit different, right? So there's this kind of interesting patterning that occurs where they all look about the same, but yet somehow each one has a uniqueness to it. But the real power, as I see it, is the sense that they are actually part of the machinery that makes our entire system go. So whatever these things do, I don't know, they are called winding towers. I didn't even look up what a winding tower is because it doesn't matter to me. What, ma what matters to me is that there's this feeling you get when you look at these that what, what, whatever products we have, I don't know, the laminate on this table, whatever the plastic is that's in this microphone, somehow or another, it had, its w it had to work its way through an industrial system that was largely invisible to me. And whatever like, these things do, and they all are doing this, the same thing. That's why they look the same. Um, they are the ways that they're part of the mechanism by which like the, the way we live our lives kind of are the objects, the products, the, how they are made and get distributed to us. So they're part of like this invisible infrastructure. So it's almost as if if Warhol was interested in the label, then they are interested in the can, right? And the can that has to be made that somehow it has to transport the soup in such a way that we can then eat it as part of a, you know, the network. And you know, students of the Bechers um, explore similar things like Gursky, for example. Um, and this is a picture, this is called 99 cents. And, um, and it's a picture of, oh, by the way, I was in a 99 cent store just this weekend. It looks exactly like this, it's amazing. Um, uh, and this is a picture of the distribution system of our consumer goods, um, where it's as though the channels that circulate products through the globe are so massive that they cannot even narrow down when they arrive at the place where they of the individual, when they come in contact with the, with the consumer, they still have the massive quality. They're not even human scale. They're still the scale of the system itself. And, um, and it, it's like, um, it's, to me, it's like going to um, Bed Bath & Beyond like before Christmas. You feel, like the, you feel like the enormity of our entire system of production being like glaring in front of you. Um, Similarly to the Chicago Board of Trade, here are the jets, this is um, also by Gursky, and here the jet stream of capital that makes all of the production possible is completely decentralized and anonymous. Um, and, and, and 
and like, this is a kind of snapshot of the decentrality, the anonymity, the speed um, uh, of our system of capital. So what you see here again is the, as these artists find new forms and images to, ca to capture the churn of our society. Um, and Julie Miretu is a younger artist. Um, she's 50, she's younger than them, um, who I think is interested in how it is that the speed of global capital can become a model for a new kind of abstraction in painting. And, um, and then when you stop looking at this from a macro level, you start to look at it from a more the level of the individual, that's actually where um, these works um, by Robert Longo come to mind for me. Because in this series, which is, like, I think, one of my favorite series in you know, in the history of 20th, 20th century art, um, you have photographs of well-dressed people like in, dis in contorted poses and postures. Um, and and I, I see an, an analog between the, the sort of views of the system at this macro level you know, and these men in cities um, that all depict these well-dressed people in these abstracted spaces, ideal spaces, um, in the, these incredible bodily, active, dynamic poses. Um, it's a little bit like dance, a little bit like pain. And you wonder, like, what is the thing that makes these well-dressed people move this way? See, I see the entire energy of the capitalist system coursing through them. So as if, as, as, as if all the energy that you saw in the Gursky photographs and all the, um, the, 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 the tension that, that, that Warhol sees within the, the cycling of imagery, uh, of imagery and production in our culture, here it is moving through their bodies as if the individual bearing the for is bearing the force of the system. It's like the terror of the label coming loose on the can. But we no longer have um, our support. And um, Jenny Holzer, would, she, when her anal analysis, her look at society is through language. Um, and she finds forms that, that borrow from traditional forms of our culture, forms of advertising, in this case, uh, the plaque, which is the statement of authority. Um, and uh, you know, this statement is, it takes a while before you can step over inert bodies and go ahead with what you were wanting to do, right? So how profound a truth is that of the nature of our society? This is, it's as if this is why like, our bodies are contorted when we allow the force of modern capitalist society run through us. We're contorted because we have to do all these distortions in order to be able to live in this society as Jenny Holzer would see it. Um, and uh, like, uh, uh, like, what does it mean to live in a society with so much inequality? How do we have to anesthetize ourselves in order to be able to live in, in the society we live in? Um, and so uh, her words like plumb the depths, attempting to encapsulate what is, the nature, what is our nature as a society um, in ways that might be invisible to us. Um, and then this work, um, I actually think about a lot. Uh, she often puts her works in public places, um, and it reads as a simple statement. Fathers often use too much force, but it actually isn't simple. It combines two statements. It, combine, it combines the statement, fathers always use force. Sometimes they use too much. That's the implicit um, conjuncture in that. Um, and uh, you know, she's, again, this is like looking for language describes how we act. And Cindy Sherman, what I love about her film still works is the way that she plays with the fact that we carry the history of images with us already. So she takes these self-portraits in such a way that triggers our pre-existing memory of film, not as specific reference, but as a reference to the entire category of film images. And the power of these works, for me, comes from this tension 
between the feeling that this is absolutely familiar to us, but not being able to locate exactly where it's from. For example, like if she were to sort of do a, 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 um, like a, a self-portrait as Macaulay Calkins putting on aftershave, you know, with his mouth like wide open and you know in shock. Well, then it would be a one-liner. It would be it would have a spe specificity to it. But these have um, a generality to it, while while like the specificity is in the genre. We know that they reference film, but we don't know which film. And the ease of which we identify these as film images highlights how codified the world of images is. So, so I think for Warhol um, and for the other artists I was referring to who are interested in the system, for them, there's a kind of ocean of images out there. There's a kind of ocean of products out there. And for her, she's like, oh, actually, those images are highly differentiated and highly codified. And it's actually extremely easy to um, identify those codes which create those divisions within that sort of sea of imagery. And um, this work uh, um, by Lorna Simpson also conveys a, what I would see as a similar aversion to the idea of the so-called straight photographic portrait. Um, it's by Lorna Simpson. It's the image, um, is, it's called a water bear. And um, the image is, uh, the image of the water bear is a classic motif in history of art. Um, it evokes the, in, it traditionally evokes the peasant, the laborer, um, popular in the 19th century. Um, and, and this image clearly has this allegorical nature to it. Um, like, it's like the figure of justice carrying the scales. And you can sense that allegory by the sort of abstraction. There's no context for it. Um, and uh, by the, the highly theatrical um, position of the arms. Um, and the image like, also like, conveys, you, know, you, you see a black woman. Um, there is a sense of uh, duality here, the sort of plastic on, you know, cheap plastic container on the, on the one hand, and their hand, the sort of elegant metal container. There's a sense of inequality already within the imagery. And then, of course, the, 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 the language sorry, adds this other dimension to it. She saw him disappear by the river. They asked her to tell what happened, only to discount her memory. So this describes a kind of crime scene investigation, um, something like that. Uh, you have divisions of class, divisions of gender and race intermingling within it. Um, but it's, it's the portrait not of, uh, of an individual, but of the history of the experience of black women in America. Um, so the, the arrow of reference like lands not in any specific individual or specific event in history, but uh, an entirety of experience for category or class um, of people. And you know, and the idea of like the, the, the water, water, the water that's pouring out, the water is like speech, the speech that is not um, heard. Um, but also water sustains life. So, so for Lorna Simpson, the systems that support life are not just the gray pipes that the Burns and Hilla Besher describe that, fl that create the flows throughout our, our, our society, but the systems also involve the laborers who bear all the weight, who do the work, and who are disproportionately people of color in our society. And um, I, I was referring to this sense of like her aversion to, her distrust of the, the image. Um, I, maybe I did it a little quickly, but I really wanted to emphasize how um, by turning the figure away from the camera so you don't see the, the individual face, that actually she gets access to a different kind of study of society, um, a different access to like beyond the particular of the individual. Um, so this one is called 20 Questions, a Sampler. Um, and the, I don't know if you could read the text, but I'll read it to you. It says um, on the bottom there, those little plaques that say, is she pretty as a picture or clear as crystal or pure as a lily or black as coal 
or sharp as a razor. It's beautiful use of language here. And um, she, what I find particularly interesting is when she draws you in with these traditional descriptions of feminine beauty, right? Pure as a lily. Um, but then, by the end, she brings to the surface the violence that is central to the history of race in America. Um, she's as sharp as a razor. But of course, at the same time, it's an assertion of female power. So she maintains this sort of duality um, and, and this kind of poetics of that duality of female agency and also the sort of the very specific history of um, women and particularly black women. And, um, and I think that the, the sense of the seduction of imagery um, is, is itself thematized in artists like Lorna Simpson in a way that um, Warhol sort of accepted as given. Like he embraced the seductiveness of celebrity imagery. Um, and in fact, um, he lived it, he, he produced it, he reproduced it. Um, whereas that becomes a question, the, seduc the seduction of imagery becomes like a, a, something to actually be suspicious of for Lorna Simpson. At the same time as she uses seductiveness in other ways, like in this case, I think she uses language through um, as a as a means of seduction, um, as you're drawn in, you know, through this sort of very flowery poetic language. Um, I think a similar work of seduction and um, uh, tension occurs with the work of Kara Walker, who also is an African-American artist interested in specifically uh, representing African-American experience of violence. Um, and the works have a kind of charisma to them um, because of the, um, the silhouette forms, which create a little bit of a detachment from the, the individual experience, detach you from the, that reality just slightly. Um, and, and create a kind of graphic elegance to them, so much so that it takes you a second to, to see the specific violences that occur. And, and this is um, a large scale um, cut paper wall mural that, that um, is at the High Museum, um, but you can see that in almost any of her works. Um, and I'm particularly interested in the way that she uses also the sort of seduction, seduction of imagery to actually achieve political ends in a similar way that Lorna Simpson does. Um, and I think she also thematizes that in um, more recent work that she did, uh, large scale sculpture um, in Brooklyn. Um, this is uh, made of, sh it's actually sugar, sugar covered and it's in a, domino, in a Domino's factory that had closed that it was now going to be used for um, condominiums <laughs> and uh, Creative Time had the opportunity to um, produce ar an art project there. They invited Kara Walker and she created this amazing Sphinx, which is um, part human in the image of a, um, a Manny and um, as well as the uh, like you know, it's part Sphinx. And so she calls this um, a subtlety. Subtlety was the, was the name of the sugar, the, the traditional name for sugar made crystalline structures, um, sculptures. A subtlety or the marvelous sugar baby, an homage to the unpaid and overworked artisans who have refined our sweet tastes from the cane fields to the kitchens of the new world on the occasion of the demolition of the Domino Sugar Refining Plant. So um, what you have is a reference to how the West used slave labor to work the sugar plantations to satisfy the sweet tooth desires of much of the world. And so what is the price a society is willing to pay for the pursuit of its pleasures, right? Who bears the burden of society's satisfaction of its desires? Now, what I love about the work is um, the way she imagines art as a sphinx, right? As a carrier of both knowledge and mystery. 
Um, so there is this relationship here between myth, um, myth as Sphinx, but also the relationship between myth and stereotype, right? They, they both sort of are structures of a kind of, of the social imagination. And, um, and I think rather than evading sort of the, um, the mythic, the realm of the mythic and the imaginary, she, she actually works through them. She, she plays with the ability of art to function in this zone of the myth and the, um, even a, 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 as a stereotype, to be able to create a sense of desire. And even the sugar-coated nature of the object suggests like the idea of art as this um, realm of pleasure that she's not going to shy from. And I think that you see that very clearly in the work of Isaac Julian, a British artist of Caribbean descent. Um, this is a, he's mostly a film artist. He started m more in, in a queer cinema, black queer cinema in Britain, um, and then began to work more in the art world. And this is actually a series of photographs um, that are connected to a film he did in Baltimore, um, called Baltimore. I was the uh, originating curator on the project and I tried to convince him I, I told them like, listen, when you're in London, then they calling a film Baltimore is like cool. But when you're in Baltimore, it's really boring. It's called a film Baltimore. Um, but he's still called it Baltimore. Anyway, so um, what you have here in this, uh, in this series is um, a juxtaposition between works of art from the Walters Art Museum, uh, Renaissance and Baroque paintings and sculpture, uh, juxtaposed with uh, great, juxtaposed with wax figures of great black leaders from the Great Blacks and Wax Museum in Baltimore, which is a vernacular pedagogic um, space for um, teaching kids mostly um, about like positive role models. And Placing these sort of heroic black figures next to European art is a reminder that our art, our, um, our history of art, is it's also a statement of what we, as a culture, as a society, aspire to be. And our art creates what we desire. Um, and so therefore, we place our own positive imagery that we want to um, try to, as we want to create these interventions in this pool of existing imagery, that, that, that if we want to create positive images to sort of manipulate how desire works, so that desire is um, now funneled into these sort of positive role models, well, we are doing that within an existing pool of history that we have to sort of work, work with and sometimes against. Um, and I think that I believe that what Isaac Julian is doing is he is affirming the seductive power of images in his films and his photographs. Um, so the big old Cadillac um, has a place in the poor neighborhood. He's not saying like, well, here you are. Why are you just you know, satisfying your capitalist appetite for fancy car when you know you're live in this poor neighborhood and you have you know you you actually have other needs that you might need to fill is not this kind of judgment um, there's actually an affirmation of de our desires um, and I believe that actually comes from originates in his like if I'm from queer cinema which is like very much oriented around the affirmation of um, of desire to suggest that our desires are not our own, that we, that we possess our desires, whether or not they are politically correct, we still, they still arise within us. And the goal is not to sort of try to cancel those desires and sort of create new ones, but to actually to, to work within a realm where we can actually enable our desire, create a space for our desires to have um, presence. Um, in our world, and it's through desire, not by avoiding it, that actually we can get to some um, other place as a society. 
So by creating highly seductive images, I believe he is saying that the task is not to strip away fantasy and see the harsh reality of urban life, um, but rather we need to navigate the theater of our own desires um, as our, our desires become our environment. And this is very much the case with uh, Marilyn Minter. Um, and I, I, her images are, are highly, these are, this is a painting um, by Marilyn Minter, this photorealist. She's, she's, she's a technical genius when it comes to painting. Um, but uh, she paints these highly seductive paintings that are also um, embodiments of fashion, femininity, cosmetics, luxury. Like a lot of the things that, uh, like, that people see as actually part of the part of the problem, um, and like are are being stuck with our fascination with luxury and femininity or other issues that actually could actually create stereotypes that actually create kind of divisions that are entrenched. And very similarly to Isaac Julian, I think what she's saying is that she's saying like, no, like, and I. I, what we need to do is we need to actually not deny our fantasies. Our fantasies are never PC, and they don't have to be PC. We don't police ourselves, but rather we affirm our fantasies and create the space where we can enact them in a safe way. And so like, I, I believe that all of her works take desire as her subject. And like Warhol, I don't believe she has an, an ironic distance to, the, to that world. Um, to the world of fashion, the world of luxury, she's like breathing it in and, and, and breathing it out um, and not stifling it. So, um, you know what? I uh, have a few more artists that I was going to talk about, but I think I'd rather just open it up to questions now because I know that we we're supposed to end at 7.30. So why don't we turn the lights on? We'll end it there. Oh, thanks. Nobody has a question? Let's just want to go to the reception. Okay. I'm um, stunned by this um, relative, relevatory presentation, actually. Oh. Oh. Um, I, I'm a person who reads a lot of history, and um, I'm reading about uh, American Democracy right now, written in 1832, called Democracy in America. And um, I've never seen visually what a, a book that takes uh, 750 pages presented in an hour <laughs> about the sweep of history in the 20th century. And I wonder if you intentionally put Bonar in at the beginning to refer to mankind's um, look to the infinite, to the universal, and then its descent into almost the oblivion of individuals at the end of the 20th century. Do you agree with that? Is that what you see in this art? So are you reading Democracy in America by Tocqueville? Yes. OK. Well, I, um, yeah, I, I, I read that book like five times. I, I love it. I really think that. Um, and, I, and I probably, some of what Tocqueville is saying is probably informing my interest, because Tocqueville always talked about um, the agitated state of American society as opposed to the stasis of European institutions and like the stasis of aristocracy. And I believe that Tocqueville understood what Warhol understood about American society. I, I believe that there is like that there, and, and, and I believe also like the agitated state, like that's the contortions of the men in the cities. Like that is that state that we have this restlessness 
is it restlessness is, a, is another term that Tocqueville uses. Um, and I think much of what Tocqueville is talking about is how is the temporality, the time of, of democratic society. And, and, and what I think is interesting is that he also saw in that, like kind of like what Lorna Simpson sees in that. He's, he, he saw the opportunity for agency, for the ability to act. He's like, well, you know, on the one hand, they're all agitated and they're like restless and they can't stand still. But on the other hand, they're like still doing, they're doing things. They're getting things done as opposed to in Europe. And I, I believe that actually Tocqueville is so subtle in his understanding about that contrast. And that's actually, a, I, if I would thought about that, I probably would have even talked about Tocqueville in this. But they, and actually, um, maybe because I, the, next, the next thing I had was, the next co- part of the conversation was about like portraits of America. Like I believe like Glenn Ligon, I think, does amazing portraits of America. And, um, and so anyway, awesome. Thank you. Let's uh, have a beer and talk about Tocqueville sometime. Yes. All right. Are there any other awesome questions? <laughs> no, just kidding. No, um, no, no. You can ask anything. You can ask anything. I'm ready. Thank you. Can you go back to the slides at all? Yeah, I can. I, I, we're my wife and I are familiar, yeah, very familiar with with that Gemini's work, and I just find that plaque in itself, not her marble benches, which are very imposing, but this plaque in itself is is so intimidating and so powerful, um, and what captures my eyes is all, all the W's, especially <laughs> at the end, <laughs> and how they're crisscrossing. I just wanted to make a comment about. Oh, that. great! Well, um, thank you for that. Uh, I, I, I do think that Jenny Holzer is brilliant when it comes to language, and um, and this is from the Survival series, which she also did in Marble. Um, but I'm not sure. I don't know if this particular text was also in Marble. Um, but I do think that as a plaque, it's got this incredible authority to it that that it, that, it, that is that is very um, unsettling. Yeah, so I, I think that this is she's somebody who you have this feeling like, oh yeah, that's just text, like that's just like clever words. But but then you realize, wow, that's actually pretty powerful. It's and it's po- like poetic and insightful and um, uh, it's like razor sharp. Yep. Uh, thank you so much. Is it possible to just skip ahead to some of the other things? I'm fascinated with your whole talk and I'd love to see briefly if you could, well, the things if that you're comfortable with that, if the things that were coming that we didn't get oh, to Oh, it's only two other artists left. Um, one was Glenn Ligon, who I think, who's Hans work I think is an incredible like way of capturing symbolizing American democracy and specifically like you know it's 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 taken from the million man march so it also references protest and black experience and it's both somehow both asking for something and also saying I'm here and I, and I think that's an incredible um tension that he holds and and then also this idea, of like uh, this picture of America as as it's called double America, is I think so intense because you know this really I think there's no better way of showing a picture of America than showing us facing two directions, um, com- like divided and um, like black white. I feel like. You know, polarized, all of that, I think, is a captured picture of America. And then I was going to end with Guillermo Quitzka, who, um, who finds in the image of the, um, the theater, he finds that the way of sort of encapsulating um, modern society. And it, the theater, with its sense of entertainment, like we're all looking to be entertained, but also the theater conveys this sort of, like the kind of fascist gathering, the, it connotes um, the sort of the inequality of the sort of the few and the many, 
the sort of the anonymity of the masses. Um, so the, the idea of theater, you know, evokes Greek theater and the theater of democracy that Aristotle and Plato refer to, but it also, um, you know, captures all the things that are like mm, the all the stress points within modern culture. And so I was going to talk a little bit about those too. Um, so that's it. Not, 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 you didn't miss much. And there it goes. I, I probably just finished it more efficiently than I would have if I was during the lecture. Um, anything else? Do we, have any, hey, do we have any questions from uh, our, we have like 100 people streaming tonight. Let's give them a hand. Guys. I'm sure that technology is not easy for them, so that's good for them. Um, do we have any questions from the streamers? No. Okay. Well then, if there are no more questions, you've got a reception now. So I hope you'll enjoy that. And I will hope to see you at many, um, at, at any number of the events we've got coming up. You saw them on the screen before. Um, we've got, most importantly, uh, oh yeah, the Robert Longo talk this Saturday. And um, then we have a reception in the galleries. We have um, all events every Thursday this month for Black History Month. And then we have Barbara Goddard doing a talk um, about her work March 8th. And then we have um, the opening of our spring exhibitions uh, opening party with, on April 21st. And then April 20th, we'll have a preview dinner, gala dinner to celebrate those exhibitions. So lots of things coming up. Thank you all for coming. My, I guess my, I'm giving one more of these. Number three would be March 9th. Thanks, guys. <laughs>